Hey guys, how's it going? This is our first video for Beauty and Mind, and uh, what I want to do is take you through Gadamer's text, at least the first half, and just highlight some of the features that I found in it uh, that were worth contemplating. Um, I don't intend to give you a definitive uh, reading. I don't intend to tell you exactly how this should be understood. But, uh, again, to start the conversation, give you some points that I think are worth discussing, and then hear from you this week um, to see what you got out of this. So what I'll just do is take you through some points. Um, don't have any uh, anything particularly planned, but finding highlights in the text. So I give you uh, a few words, vocabulary words, I didn't expect you to know when you began this, and I'll just review those very briefly. The ontology of the work of art. The ontology refers to, it's just a fancy word for being, the way of being. So, uh, you know, there are different things in the world. There are uh, physical things, tables, chairs. Those have a particular way of being. Um, of course, tables and chairs are manufactured by humans, so they might have a different being, different kind of being, a different ontology than a rock, which is not uh, manufactured. Um, so philosophers would argue about that. Is it important to make that distinction? Um, but then you might also have something like a number, which is n not physical at all. It's not manufactured into a physical object. It's not made out of material but it seems to have a kind of being, a kind of reality, or, or at least uh, some kind of uh, persistent meaning that well, we would want to think about and ask what kind of being does it have. And then you would have things like uh, dreams. What, what's the ontology of a dream? What's the status of the dream? What kind of being does it have? Then you might have things like friendship. Um, so philosophers ask, um, what is the ontology uh, of the various things that we encounter in the world? Should they all be included in one ontology? Are there different ontologies, etc.? What is the being? And in this case, Gadamer wants to know about a work of art. So a painting, a piece of music, a play, um, a dance, anything that we would call a work of art, and he doesn't mean necessarily fine art, but anything, a, a product, an art product, artistic product. Um, what is its status? How does it be, right? How does it exist? And how can we make sense of that? Now, it's hermeneutic significance. Um, hermeneutic refers to interpretation. And uh, Gadamer is, is a philosopher who's very aware that it's nearly impossible for human beings even brilliant philosophers like all of us, to uh, come up with answers to these big, deep questions about ontology and existence without inserting and participating um, in the interpretation that we're giving things. So on one hand, we would all like, I suppose, maybe, maybe some would not, but many people would like to gain an objective purely um, non-subjective understanding of the way things are just in themselves. But Gadamer is a philosopher who thinks that we have to begin where we're at, human beings in this time and place, this culture, this language, these backgrounds. And so by definition then everything that we do, even in philosophy, is some mode of interpretation. So we should be aware from the start that when we ask questions about something like the work of art, we're asking questions that make sense to us. Making, we're asking questions that uh, betray some interest of our own or some assumptions of our own. And so it's only right and good that we be aware of that fact as well. We don't just throw our hands up in despair and say it's all interpretation. There's no meaning. But uh, that we be aware of our, our own biases, perhaps, and assumptions. Even if we don't know what they are, we know we have them. So that's the title. <laughs> um, how can we approach the being of a work of art, any kind of work of art, with the awareness that we're always interested in its significance for us, and we're always asking questions that relate to us. 
and don't have a simple um, access to the way things are in themselves. So one of, the, one of the clues I think Jagger in class asked if I had some clues or advice for how to read a philosophical text, and I know I stuttered and stammered my way through an answer, um, but I'll give you one now, and it comes right here. I'll read a bit. The section is entitled Play as the Clue to Ontological Explanation. For my starting point, I select an idea that has played a major role in aesthetics, the concept of play. I wish to free this concept of the subjective meaning that it has in two philosophers, Kant and Schiller, and that dominates the whole modern aesthetics and philosophy of man. So my first piece of advice is to keep your ears open for moments like this when a philosopher tells you what he or she is arguing against. Right? He's just said here, I want to free this concept of play from a certain conception. And he says it's a conception that holds in these two philosophers' ideas and that he believes dominates people's discussions of art and uh, philosophy of art and aesthetics in his day. Now, he's writing in about 1980, by the way. So this should tell you something, that he believes that there's a long tradition and a very powerful tradition of saying that, well, art and aesthetics and the work of art is essentially, he says, subjective. And what that means is this is a tradition that says, look, people disagree about what's beautiful and what's interesting, and that's a clue that really you, you can't look at a piece of art and come up with any um, objective facts about it that make it beautiful. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. They would say beauty is perhaps in the mind of the beholder. And so we need to look to what's going on in the human mind when, uh, say, an individual experiences beauty. Because beauty, they are saying, is essentially subjective. It's something that individuals experience sort of from within and so on this view you have to examine the human mind let's say or those who are more say materialistically oriented would say you have to examine the human brain again which they take to be a subject the, the seat of subjectivity of our sort of private perspective on the world and Gadamer is saying I reject that I'm going to ask about the work of art, and I'm not going to begin and assume that the answer lies in the structure of the human mind or the human brain. So, every, every philosophy is a dialogue. Every philosophy is meant to address questions that are already floating around in the world among philosophers and psychologists and historians, etc., and so whenever a philosopher says, I'm not going to say this, or I'm going to argue against something, I should give you a clue that there's probably a whole lot of people uh, prior to them and perhaps in their own time who are uh, asserting the thing that they want to reject. So look for that. He says, we can certainly distinguish between play and the behavior of the player which as such belongs with the other kind of subjective behavior. So he's saying that, you know, there's another way of thinking about subjectivity, which is something like how a work of art affects us. And this, again, would be uh, something like, does it make us feel happy? Does it make us feel a certain way? And thus almost mechanically um, alter our behavior. We can read um, the meaning of the work of art in, by the behavior of the person viewing it. And he says this, again, is not um, his approach. Thus it can be said that for the player, play is not serious. That is why he plays. Now, I don't know where he gets this. 
He says, thus it can be said. I don't see anything in what he said so far to justify this, but I think he's just throwing out his ideas, and then he's going to elaborate on them. But it's a key idea. You need to judge for yourself. He says, for the player, for you're playing a video game, you're playing, right? Playing basketball, playing chess. The play is not serious, one, and that's why you play. <laughs> so you're attracted to, you're drawn to the fact that this is not serious. You might say nothing's at stake, right? You die on level seven or whatever game you're playing. Nothing is at stake. So it's okay. You can just play and not worry about the consequences. And there's something attractive about that. He says, we can try to define the concept of play from this point of view. What is merely play is not serious. But he says, play has a special relation to what is serious. So if it's not serious, it's not far from the serious. It has a kind of relation. It is not only that the latter, what is serious, gives it its purpose. We play for the sake of recreation, as Aristotle says. More importantly, play itself contains its own even sacred seriousness. Yet in playing, all those purposive relations that determine active and caring existence have not simply disappeared, but are curiously suspended. So he's digging right into this very quickly. He's making lots of claims about play, and you have to slow down and ask yourself if this is accurate. But when uh, you know your parents come over th for Thanksgiving and they say, let's play a game, He's claiming that you know right away that uh, this is not a serious endeavor. This is not something where if you lose, uh, you're going to lose your mortgage or you're going to, you know, a girlfriend's going to leave you or anything like that. There's a kind of unseriousness about play. But he's going to say it has a relation to what is serious. And when you enter into play, he's claiming, the everyday, what he calls here the purposive relations that determine our active existence. So all of those things that are tied to purposes for you. You want to eat, so you get some food and eat. You want to have fun, so you go hang out with your friends. You want to buy something, so you go to work and earn money. All of those kinds of relations in your everyday life. Now ask yourself if this is the case they kind of get suspended, right? Your parents say, hey, let's go, let's go play a game of risk. And what that means is, come join us in this activity, which is not all that serious, although maybe it has a kind of seriousness. But, but what you also know is they're inviting you to an activity where all of the things you would normally care about in an activity, this is the point, we're always engaged in activities, and those activities normally have a simple or complex purpose involved. That's not the case in play. They're inviting you to an activity that really has no purpose. Or if it has a purpose, it's not a normal purpose. It's not going to achieve anything for you. Just like painting. You say, I'm going to go in, in my room and paint for a couple hours. Why? Why? You say, I'm going to go eat for a couple hours or sleep for a couple hours or, you know, do almost anything else that's non-playful for a couple hours. You can say what the purpose is. There's something about playing where those normal purposes get suspended. Okay. Next claim, a couple lines down. Play fulfills its purpose only if the player loses himself in play. All right, another dimension to this. So your parents say, let's play Risk. Let's get together and play Risk. It's not serious. Um, you will suspend the normal things you care about, right? the homework you have to do and all of that just sort of goes away for a while. And when you enter into it, you get lost in it. Right? It, it can absorb you. And uh, again, you have to ask yourself if this is uh, accurate description of what normally happens in play. All right. So uh, still on 102, down near the bottom, about eight lines up. 
to the next claim. He says, the, the work of art is not an object that stands over against a subject for itself. Okay, so it's not. Again, this is another example where a lot of people would say, the work of art is hanging on the wall in the museum, and you are standing there looking at it. The work is there, and you're here. Clear, clearly there's a gap between you two, and we should understand that there's a difference. He wants to say, the work of art has its true being, here's the ontology, has its true being in the fact that it becomes an experience that changes the person who experiences it. So, there's some involvement of this subject, right? You have to have a mind, for example. You have to have senses. You have to have a brain in order to have any experience at all. So he wants to sort of hold this very thin line between the interpretation he rejects, which is that we need to understand the human mind in order to understand beauty, because that's really where beauty happens. He says, no, this is in the work of art itself. And yet he says the work of art doesn't become a work of art until we experience it. Or, he's saying, until it changes our experience. So the picture he's trying to paint here, so to speak, is that the work of art acts upon us. Right? It's a kind of active force which, when we encounter it, transforms us in some way. Now, let me pause here to just to say that let's not just think about paintings on a wall. Let's think about music. Let's think about drama, which he'll talk about later in theater. Um, he'll make the point that, you know, Shakespeare wrote a bunch of plays, right? We all know Macbeth. Well, what is, what is the manner of being of Macbeth? It's like, what is the manner of being of a dream, right, or a number? The manner of being of Macbeth, he would say, does not, cannot be understood if you say it's a bunch of words on a page, or it's something Shakespeare wrote, or it's something that an audience witnesses. He would say the, the real meaning of a play, its way of being a play, is that it is performed for an audience. That is the essential condition, you, know, you might say, of a play. If it just sits in a book, it is not realizing its full being as a play. To be um, a play is to be performed. So the performance fulfills, you might say, the, the full um, being of any play. So in that sense, um, the work of art is almost to be taken literally. It's something like the work that art does in the world. Right? So the game of risk isn't something that sits in a box, right? The game of risk is something that is performed. It is enacted. It is um, acted out. And it's acted out by individuals, but the individuals don't create the game. The game invites the individuals into its world that, that they get lost in, etc. So it's in the performance, the doing of the game that the game exists. That is its mode of being. So when you think about the, the phrase, a work of art, in the title here, um, that typically we think of a, a painting right, hanging on a wall. And he's going to argue that that painting is not a work of art until it works on us. But I want you to maybe take other models as well. So a piece of music. Its mode of being is being played, performed, not thought, not imagined, not transcribed into notation, but being performed. And in its being performed, it works on those who encounter it. It does its work. That is the work of art. It's active. 
Okay. So 103, he makes a similar argument. He says the players are not the subjects of the play. One way of saying that is the players are not the source or the origin. They don't control the play. Instead, play merely reaches presentation. Again, the Shakespeare's play sits in a book, and it has to be presented. It reaches presentation through the players. So the, the great actors who have performed Hamlet, it's not that the play presents the actors. The actors present the play. The actors are just the means by which the play is worked and does its work. So the play is primary. All right. Quite differently then, he changes tone in the middle of 103 and moves to some words, um, just common language that we use, moving out of the world of, of art and into mm -hmm. just language. He says, if we examine how the word play is used and concentrate on its metaphorical senses, we find talk of play of light, the play of waves, the play of gears or parts in machinery, the interplay of limbs, the play of forces, the play of nets, even a play on words. He must have written this in summer to talk about nets, right? In each case, what is intended, he says, what do all these have in common? How are they all playful? What is intended is a to and fro movement. One, a to and fro movement. When I read this, you know, it took me a little while, but it seems like such a beautiful uh, way of describing what is common to all of these ideas, right? You're playing with words. It's a kind of back and forth, right? A to and a fro, an up and a down, in and out, and back and forth, right? You're playing with the words. You're, move, they're, you're letting them move. They, you're following their motion, um, the play of waves, the play of forces. A to and fro, a up and down, in and out, forward and back, left and right, playful, right? The limbs of a tree, playful, yeah? Swaying, back and forth, kind of playfulness in there, yeah? And the light coming off of it, playful. Correlatively, the word spiel in German originally meant dance and is still found in many word forms. Spiel is game, or I'm sorry, play. The movement of playing has no goal that brings it to an end. Woo! Another big, big claim here. So, there's something about this to and fro movement, whether it's in a football game, or a piece of music, or light dancing on the water. There's something about it that does not require an end or a goal. Right? So this gets a little bit back to his earlier point that when we, when someone, grandma says or mom and dad say, let's go play a game, what they're saying is, let's suspend the normal things that we care about, the normal purposes that are important to us, and let's just play a game. Here, he's saying, when you get caught up in the middle of play, what you find is that ending it, uh, having a purpose, having a goal, having a direction is largely absent. It's the point is not to have it culminate in something, but is to perhaps enjoy or participate or observe the back and forth, the to and fro. A few lines down. The movement of play has, as it were, no substrate. It is the game that is played it is irrelevant whether or not there is a subject who plays it. The play is the occurrence of the movement as such. So if we are to admit the play of waves and the play of light and the play of um, forces, etc., then clearly play has an essence, has a meaning, has a being that does not depend upon human um, the human mind, human interpretation, um, but is part of something um, more fundamental and more prior to our ideas. 
on 104 then. This linguistic observation about playing and spiel seems to me an indirect indication that play is not to be understood as something a person does. As far as language is concerned, the actual subject of play is obviously not the subjectivity, the mind, the inner experience of the individual who plays, but is the play itself. But we are so accustomed to relating phenomena such as playing to the sphere of subjectivity and the ways it acts that we remain close to these indications from the spirit of language. All right, 105, just skipping ahead, top of the page. It happens, as it were, by itself, play. The ease of play, this is another element he brings out, right? Um, certainly not every moment and not every instance of play could be characterized as easy. If you're playing risk, there's times when it's very difficult. Um, but overall, he's saying the the general character of play is is light, is uh, free, is easy, is open-ended, is not regulated heavily by rules or demands or constraints. Um, and so typically, uh, the you might say the best examples of play, of playing music, um, are those when it's easy, when you've gained a skill, and it's flowing through you, and you do not have to think uh, very much about it. <coughs> the ease of play, which doesn't mean that there is any absence of effort, but only refers to the absence of strain, is experienced subjectively as relaxation. The structure of play, so think of playing uh, an instrument. The structure of play absorbs the player into itself and frees him from the burden of taking the initiative, which constitutes the strain of existence. So it's not as though you don't have to concentrate. It's not as though you don't have to um, show effort to play a piano solo, if you play piano, but the playfulness of it, right? It's truly playful when you are not um, in conflict with it, but it is a easier flow, a skillful flow of activity. So it could be very difficult on one level, but with skill and mastery, it becomes playful because it is easy. Middle of 105, the most important being of the work of art is connected with the medial, the middle sense of play. Inasmuch as nature is without purpose and intention, just as it is without exertion, it is a constantly self-renewing play and can therefore appear as a model for art. Okay, one of his deeper points here, which many, many philosophers have wrestled with over the years, but here he's making the claim that there's something in nature itself, which he says is from his perspective, obviously not uh, based upon intention. So the tree swaying, the branches swaying, are not doing so because they intend to sway or have the purpose uh, in mind to sway. So it's this natural back and forth without purpose and intention that is constantly self-renewing. So I would think this you know, maybe has uh, a couple of dimensions. One is... There's really no end to the uh, swaying back and forth of, of light and of various specific elements of nature. Um, the wind may stop, um, but not because there's some goal or purpose stopping, not because it's fulfilled any purpose, but just because the wind has stopped and then it can start again. But perhaps, probably what he has in mind here is something uh, bigger and grander than that, which is the um, seasons. Right, the back and forth of the seasons, the back and forth of the stars and the sun and the moon, and the uh, self-renewal of all of those cycles, and the uh, tides, and in fact, of course, the cycle of life and death, 
which uh, is not driven, it appears, by purposes, but has a kind of internal back-and-forth playful movement of growth and decay, etc. So there's a playful element to the world of nature, and this has very often inspired artists, of course, to copy it, but could also serve us as a model of human play, or of the play that human beings engage in. Let's pause.